Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, I'm really pleased to have Annette Cluett and Andrew Lecure. Um, Andrew's with uh, Crunchy Data, and Annette is the principal architect here at Red Hat. And they're going to talk about database disaster recovery and how to make it easy. And this comes out of the Smart Cities initiatives. And um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and their topic, and they've got a great demo. Um, so I'm really interested to, to see that and how it all plays out. And if you have questions, ask them in the chat, wherever you are, on YouTube, in Blue Jeans, or on Twitch. And we'll relay them to the speakers and have some live Q&A at the end. So with that, Annette, uh, take it away. I know you guys have put a lot of effort into getting this one going. So thank you very much for being here today. Yeah, thank you, Diane. So first off, if you hear a grandfather clock in the background, that's me. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm Annette Cluett. I'm with Red Hat uh, in the Data Foundation business team and uh, be going over a lot of things that support this environment, um, including the Smart City uh, demo. Andrew? Uh, good morning. Uh, yeah, my name is Andrew Lecure. I am the Director of Operator Engineering at Crunchy Data. Um, in this role, I am responsible for the uh, development and implementation of our Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes product, also known as PGO, which I'm going to be going over in a little bit here uh, this morning in the next few slides. Thanks, for that. Okay, uh, to start out, um, just to give a bit of an overview about Crunchy. So who is Crunchy Data? You know, well, really at the end of the day, the way I like to describe it, you know, our business here at Crunchy Data is enterprise PostgreSQL. You know, if you're looking to deploy, you know, maybe if you currently deploy, looking to expand your usage of Postgres or just venturing into Postgres for the first time and looking to uh, make Postgres a big part of your enterprise, you know, we, is, we are the partner that can make that happen. You know, we do that in a variety of different ways. You know, first and foremost includes the expertise we bring to the table for everything and anything Postgres related. Um, and you can see that on the slide here. You know, we have contributors internally here within uh, Crunchy that do contribute directly uh, to PostgreSQL and the Postgres source. Um, you know, in addition to just a wealth of other vast knowledge and expertise we have within the organization. Um, but in addition to that knowledge, you know, we also bring to the table the tools and technologies um, needed to ensure you can get Postgres deployed in your environments, in your enterprise environments, according to your specific requirements and needs. You know, so this not only includes bringing things like, you know, certified versions of PostgreSQL itself, which can be deployed within your environments, um, but also providing the tools and technologies needed to facilitate deploying PostgreSQL within your environment. You know, in a variety of different environments where you might be deploying PostgreSQL, you know, and that includes cloud environments, which we're going to be touching a bit on today. You know, and in Crunchy here, we have a few, few products along those lines. You know, the slide there did mention our Crunchy Bridge solution, which is a fully managed, um, you know, PostgreSQL uh, cloud solution. But today we're going to be talking about Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes, uh, which is our Kubernetes based solution um, for managing Postgres. So what is Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes? Well, we like to describe it as declarative, uh, declarative uh, Postgres. And really what this is, it's an open source solution, we also call it PGO, um, that allows you to facilitate and streamline um, the deployment of um, production-ready PostgreSQL clusters by simply declaring what you want your clusters to look like. So within the solution, we have what's called a declarative API, which allows you to define, you know, simply via a spec exactly what you want your production-grade um, PostgreSQL clusters to look like. Next slide, Annette. So to dig into this a bit, you know, what do we mean with a fully declarative solution? You know, um, you know, really what that means is, you know, anything you might need to deploy to ensure your database architectures, you know, are fully production ready to go, um, ready to meet your needs, your requirements. Um, what we're talking about here is allowing you to have a convenient, easy to, easy to use way to define um, via what we call a spec exactly what you want your architecture to look like. So for instance, you know, to touch on a couple topics that are going to be relevant to our conversation today, if you want high availability or if you need disaster recovery, for instance, um, the solution we provide makes it as simple as defining exactly what you need for those elements within a specification 
And from there, you know, this solution, Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes or PGO, automatically um, takes those specs, configures, deploys those databases, you know, exactly how you have them defined. You know, so for instance, say you want a connection pooler, um, so your clients can connect to your database through a connection pooler like PG Balancer. It's as simple as defining that within the spec, and from there, our operator solution uh, will process that spec and deploy the components within your environment uh, to make that possible. You know, and again, I also touched on other functional areas, you know, this applies to as well. So um, disaster recovery, you know, we're talking databases here, right? Stateful applications, it's critical that your database is safe and protected. So um, you wanna ensure you can um, easily create backups and restore from those backups in the event of a failure. And again, that's what this solution is designed to do. It's designed to make those things um, seamless and streamlined where you know you can easily define backup schedules and get that data redundancy you need. Um, high availability is another big part of that uh, architecture as well. You know, facilitating the ability to easily spin up replicas. That way, if your um, primary database goes down, we can fail over, keep your database available um, and ready to go. And that's really what the solution is providing at the end of the day. Um, providing users with a convenient, easy um, to, to use way of defining you know, their database architectures across all pertinent functional areas, whether that's high availability, disaster recovery, monitoring, or whatever it might be, you know, and the operator um, takes control for that point and makes sure that those, uh, you know, database architectures are deployed and configured as needed according to your specific requirements. Um, next slide, Annette. So a big part of this solution, you know, so it's one thing for us to be able to, to, to take a spec that you've declared, you know, you've defined what you want your database to look like and get it out there and running, but that's only one part of the process, right? Once it's out there and running, we need to make sure it continues to be available, you know, and that your data is accessible as needed, you know, and that may, means ensuring that your database clusters can heal um, as needed. Um, so to just throw an example out there, you know, um, so, so what this means is, is this solution is constantly monitoring, um, you know, your database environments, the databases it provisions to make sure they're healthy and configured according to your needs. Um, so, for instance, to provide an example, say your cluster needs a connection pooler, and that's what's shown on this slide here. Um, and for some reason, um, someone out there, you know, chaos can exist in any cluster. Someone deletes that connection pooler, that connection pooler deployment. Well, what that means is the operator is gonna immediately detect that, recreate that deployment, and make sure your connection pooler is available and ready to use you know, immediately after that occurred. You know, and that's just a theme within our solution um, in general. You know, once you declare your cluster um, and the operator builds you know, and deploys a database architecture according to that specification, it's gonna constantly monitor it, make sure it stays healthy, and make sure all the, the, the Kubernetes resources are in place as needed to ensure that database remains healthy and continues to serve your, your database needs. Next slide. Um, in addition, you know, the, this declarative approach to defining your PostgreSQL clusters, you know, also enables GitOps workflows because what that means at the end of the day, you're defining your databases using um, simple YAML specifications that could easily be stored um, in any version control system. Um, that way, you know, um, because, you know, as we know, database requirements differ across different environments, different needs. So your databases for development versus QA versus production, you know, might all, all be a bit different. But by giving this declarative uh, method of defining your databases, you can easily store your database configurations in a version control system where they can then be easily integrated into your continuous integration or continuous deployment pipelines, you know, to easily provision the databases you need at any stage of your software development life cycle, you know, to give you the databases you require and, and ensure the data is accessible that you need for your users and uh, applications. Next slide. So another big piece of, of this solution, you know, is ensuring, um, you know, that your clusters continue, can, can be updated um, without interruption. You know, so again, we said, you know, it's one thing to get a, to get a database deployed that is out there and running, um, but that's not gonna be the end all be all for your database, right? You're gonna need to reconfigure it. You're gonna need to tune it. Maybe you deployed it without a connection pooler and now you decided you want one. 
Um, this solution is designed to make that all seamless. So, you know, as you need to evolve your database, um, your database architectures, your deployments over the course of, of a cluster's lifetime, um, you can continuously do that without interruption. You know, and through a rolling update strategy that we've implemented within the operator solution, this means you can um, safely make changes to your clusters and we will safely roll out those changes to all your instances, whether it's um, PostgreSQL configuration changes, changes to the architecture as whole. Um, you know, our solution is designed to safely and cleanly roll those changes out in a way that avoids disruptions to your data and ensures your users are still able to access the data, the, access the data they need. Um, next slide. So to sum, sum these uh, uh, bits up, so, you know, what, what are we bringing together here at the end of the day, um, you know, when we talk of, you know, talk about the crunchy post, Postgres for Kubernetes? You know, really this solution tackles, you know, the critical functional areas you need to ensure you have a production ready database system in Kubernetes. You know, first and foremost is high availability, right? And we've touched on this a bit, um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, you wanna make sure your data is available when you need it and where you need it. You know, and the Postgres operator solution makes that seamless. So, you know, the ability to add additional replicas to your clusters, you know, um, the ability to fail over to replicas in the event of a failure and make sure your data is always available as needed, you know, that is implemented in a way that is seamless and basically transparent to the end user. You know, so again, basically you're defining within our solution, you know, the elements you need. I want high availability. You know, I want multiple replicas. I want redundancy. You know, but we take that, uh, we take the, the process from there and wire that all up to make it a, make it happen. You know, we make sure those replicas are properly replicating from, um, you know, the primary database. We make sure they're configured to be able to fail over to in the event that there is a failure, you know, and your data needs to remain accessible. You know, so that's a big part of our solution, you know, because we're talking data here, right? And first and foremost, you know, we need to make sure your data is available um, when you need it and where you need it. And the high, avail high availability parts of our architecture are what make sure that happens. Um, but disaster recovery is another important piece of that too. You know, and this is another area the, the operator greatly facilitates your ability to ensure you have a strong disaster recovery solution for your database. Because at the end of the day, we need to protect against disasters, right? You know, chaos can occur, things can happen. And at the end of the day, you know, data is paramount. You wanna make sure your data is safe, it's available. You know, that way if anything goes wrong, you can properly recover um, and get back to the place you need to be. And Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes facilitates that, you know, whether it's making it easy to schedule, you know, backup so you know your database is, you know, effect effectively backed up using proper backup schedules, um, whether it's making sure your backups not only exist in, you know, or making sure there's redundancy in your backups themselves, you know, that way if you lose an entire environment, you don't lose your backups along with it. And really just all at the end of the day, making sure those backups are, um, are properly taken and can have effectively be used to recover your cluster in the event of a disaster, which is what it's all about. Um, so another important part of the ar architecture here too is monitoring, right? Um, because we wanna be able to detect problems before they manifest themselves in a big way, right? And that takes keeping an eye on the cluster. Um, one of the things Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes provides is an effective monitoring solution. You know, it's a monitoring stack that once your database is deployed out there, you can continue to keep an eye on the health of your cluster um, and continue to tweak and evolve it according to your needs. And this also means identifying problems, like I said, before they manifest, um, so you can get in front of issues with your data database and, and uh, ensure your data, again, is accessible as needed. Security is another big part of our architecture too. You know, not only is it, you know, important that your data is accessible, but it's important that access to that data is secure, right? And it's proper, properly locked down. Um, and our operator solution um, really builds in security from the ground up. You know, with all elements of our architecture, we're making sure all access to your data is done in a secure and controlled uh, manner. Whether that means enabling TLS by default, using certificate-based authentication, scram passwords, or whatever it might be, um, you know, our, our solution is designed to be secure by default. Um, and again, when we're looking at deploying production-grade clusters, you know, that is important. That's a critical part of our architecture here. 
you know, and the last piece here I want to mention is convenience, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, we want to make it easy for you to be able to manage your databases in these environments, right? So say you have a, a production database out there that you um, want to clone into a, cl a dev environment so you can do a bit of testing or troubleshooting. Again, that is um, seamlessly done with Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes. Or if you want to customize PostgreSQL or your architecture in any way possible, you know, again, we make it easy to do through this, this solution. Next slide. Uh, so to sum up here, you know, again, we've touched on a few of these things already, but um, Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes, you know, at the end of the day, it's a fully declarative and GitOps ready solution. You know, we make it so you can easily define the architectures, the other database architectures you need, you know, in a fully declarative way. And we take on the management of your database there to to create a fully seamless experience for deploying, you know, production grade PostgreSQL clusters, you know, um, and that makes it, you know, that includes making it easy to get started too. Um, you know, we want to make it so as soon as you spin up a new database, not only is that database ready to use, but it's ready to be used by applications and consumers and end users. So, you know, we do things like automatically provisioning secrets with credentials that you need. So you can just wire those things right into your applications without ever having to look up a username or a password or create Postgres accounts. Again, the idea, just making it as seamless as possible to get up and running. Um, so your end users, applications, whatever they might be, can easily get up and running. Um, using this solution. You know, and easy to upgrade, that's another big part of this too. You know, as Kubernetes and OpenShift continue to evolve, you know, we're evolving along with it. You know, and we've baked in the, the functionality to ensure that process is, is as seamless as possible for end users. You know, so you can easily upgrade your um, Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes solution, you know, as Kubernetes, OpenShift continue to evolve as well, um, get all the great new benefits that come with it, um, you know, with as um, minimal of effort as required or as possible. And at the end of the day, you know, when we sum all these things together, what does it really give you? You know, it's, it's production grade, enterprise ready PostgreSQL, right? You know, and it's ensuring we're, um, you know, allowing you to deploy the Postgres clusters um, that meet the specific needs of your enterprise, your specific requirements, their secure lockdown, you know, and make sure you have your data, data available when you, when you need it. Um, and that's really what it's all about at the end of the day. So, um, um, so yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up, Anna. Yeah. All right, thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'll speak a little bit more about what Andrew was uh, talking about in terms of deploying the, um, the latest version of, of Crunchy Data Postgres. Uh, before we do that, though, let's speak about the storage. So the group I'm in in Red Hat, uh, OpenShift, our data foundation. Uh, this is um, one of our main offerings is OpenShift Data Foundation. It used to be called OpenShift Container Storage. And I want to point out here that this is uh, very much built from um, upstream open source projects. One of the main projects um, that does the orchestration that you may have heard about just graduated from CNCF as um, is Rook. And Rook um, is orchestrating the entire deployment of the other um, very mature upstream project, Ceph. And the two of them together uh, can be deployed in a, a Kubernetes um, or, or OpenShift environment. Um, and it is totally, as, as Andrew is saying, uh, managed with, within that environment. And we'll, we'll take a look a little bit more later in the demo at some of the components, but um, you know, two projects and being very close to uh, OpenShift Data Foundation as a product, I can tell you that everything that we do downstream um, is is basically created and tested upstream before we pull it downstream. So um, you know, good good use of open source, and then the the operator framework which. Um, you know, has become really prevalent and makes it really, really easy to deploy. Um, in, in the case of, of what I'm going to show you in the demo, deploying Kafka, um, deploying Postgres, the Crunchy, deploying OpenShift Data Foundation, all of this is, is, is operator framework and um, has has also matured, I'd say, you know, I mean, operators have been discussed for the last three or four years, 
but now I would say most, most applications that are serious about being in Kubernetes uh, do, do have an operator-based deployment. And not only is uh, an operator, just to speak about it for a minute, not only is the operator deploying, but an operator is reconciling back to the state that you want, which is a very powerful um, concept in terms of, of managing your applications. So again, it, just to, to look at the, the, the components, we already spoke about Rook and Ceph. Um, the, the other one that we've included with uh, OpenShift Data Foundation or uh, used to be OpenShift Container Storage is an, uh, an object gateway that has some nice features of being able to um, sort of bridge two different environments, say Azure and AWS, and have uh, be able to mirror objects between two different clouds. So all those three are going together uh, to, to form the storage solution that uh, Postgres is, is going to use, as, as well as um, I, you'll see in the demo that we we're, we're also have Kafka. So, the, so the, the way that we use the operator framework, um, both for administrators and, and users, is there's more than one operator. Um, so we have a, what we call an OCS meta operator, and that operator is going to sort of bootstrap the other two. So the, the Rook stuff is the one that I spoke about is a, an a upstream effort, and then Nuba, Nuba Core is also upstream. But the OCS operator is sort of, you know, again, doing the reconciling, doing the management, and it's, it's always watching. If, if the OCS operator is not uh, running and ready, then something has gone astray, and you need to, to look at the other operators to figure out what has not deployed correctly. So it's a, it's a multi-level management, but um, works very nicely for getting all of the orchestration done and then maintaining and, and um, also, as, as Andrew spoke about, being able to upgrade, um, which is one of the features of, of using an operator. So getting to the, the topic of this um, particular session, if you look at the disaster recovery continuum, the, the way we're seeing it um, at, at Red Hat is that you, you starting on the top right, um, backup and restore, whether it be outside of OpenShift and Kubernetes, has been a, um, a solution for quite a long time. And the, the question is always, you know, how much do you back up? How often do you back up? And then from a restore pro, uh, point of view, how long does it take to restore? And can you restore, you know, back to a known good state? So it's, it, in terms of Kubernetes and, and what OpenShift Data Foundation has done, we've integrated highly with um, traditional backup uh, vendors, say uh, Spectrum Protect Plus or NetBackup or Trulio, um, Kasten, and we've done that via the, the CSI uh, interface, which allows you to do snapshot and clones. So that um, is quite, uh, mature, um, we released the capability to do that about a year ago, supporting the CSI standard. And, you know, we, we can um, provide more information about that, but, but as I go down, we have a regional DR. We're calling that, um, essentially this is a multi-cluster solution, and then Metro DR. So to have a little bit more context here, as I said, for backup and restore, this is done um, using um, OpenShift Data Foundation, the, the storage solution, and we're, we're doing it with snapshots and clones. So if I create a volume, mount it to an application, and then I want to have a um, crash consistent snapshot, I can use uh, the, the snapshot capability either, either directly through the UI or a YAML, um, to, to back it up, or I can hook it in to, like I said, the traditional backup vendors are all pretty much uh, now having a CSI capability to both initiate the snapshots as well as to use those snapshots to create clones for restore. And um, we have a whole list in Red Hat of, of ISVs that we've done particular testing 
and um, created video solution guides and others that, that to, to see how you do that. So regional DR is a solution sort of in, in development. Um, we have some pieces of it now at Red Hat, but uh, it's really the idea that we have multi-cluster. So the requirement here is we have you know, two clusters, uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift, and we're going to asynchronously replicate the data for the persistent volumes between those two sites. Now there's a lot of stitching and a lot of orchestration that goes into that because it's not just the data replication at the persistent level, it's also at the Kubernetes object level or resource level that you need to um, do replication. Some ideas, you know, how you could do that with, with um, upstream is using like the Valero backup and, and restore APIs. Um, but this is a solution that we, we see um, being available um, probably by the end of the year as a, you know, sort of through the advanced cluster management, which will do the orchestration for creating multi-site and then be able to um, also orchestrate the, the data replication and the Kubernetes um, resources to be, to be replicated from one cluster to another. So getting to the left here down there is sort of a, a, from a storage perspective is a synchronous solution. So that's why we call it Metro. It has to be um, within a certain latency or distance. I usually say a couple hundred miles, no more than a couple hundred miles between the sites. And the other main thing here is that we have this arbiter or consensus location. So the storage, uh, OpenShift Data Foundation, um, backed by Ceph, needs to have uh, monitors which keep track of the cluster and they need to have consensus. We also know or, uh, that etcd, which is used for the control plane of OpenShift, needs consensus. Um, something like Zookeeper, which is currently used with Kafka, needs consensus. So you need a site that you can put a consensus node at and be able to keep quorum, even in the case of a, what I'm calling a data site failure. So this is um, a solution that is available now with um, the latest versions of OpenShift Data Foundation. And you know, it, it, it is a pattern which um, you do find where sites are a couple hundred miles apart and the consensus location can be probably twice as far away, maybe 500 miles. So it, you know, it's a, it is something you can do today to have resiliency. And if we look at sort of what is the recovery time objective and the, and the RPO uh, recovery point objective, which is more about, uh, you know, did I lose any data? It is possible to get a, a recovery uh, point objective of near zero, depending on how, um, how the applications you have, really. It's about the applications. Because, you know, persistent storage is great and it, it can recover, but if, you, if the application doesn't recover, it doesn't matter that I have the storage. So these are just some of the um, sort of the ways that you could recover. There is one uh, issue which is not really um, a Red Hat or it's, it's a community issue, which is if you are having a, uh, an application pod mounting an RWO volume, and you fail the node that it's on, the kubelet lo loses um, status of that volume. It thinks it's still connected and it will not uh, release that volume so you get a multi-attach error and that is listed in the case there. Workaround right now requires a forced delete of that pod to, to allow it to recreate on an active, um, an active site. So just a little more sort of uh, information about how this would lay out. So we see that on the left-hand side, we have um, the ODF data replicas and we have the, the monitors. So at a minimum, each site would have, um, in this case, two monitors 
And then you would have at the third site your, your, fifth, mon your fifth monitor. This is for the storage. Same thing for etcd. Um, you could have a master at each site, and then you have their third site. And the, the monitor pod actually um, can use a toleration to schedule on the master, even if it's unschedulable. So the other thing we have going here is we have the, you know, the, the usual OpenShift infra services. Those would be placed in, in each data center. So if we, if we lose a data center, um, we see here that because we have two data replicas left, uh, the way that the, the storage is configured for this arbiter mode is you, every volume will have four replicas, as we showed in the prior slide, but every volume only needs two replicas and monitor quorum to continue to be able to serve reads and writes. So assuming the application survives, um, then you're going to be able to continue to, to take inbound connections at a very rapid um, recovery. Again, this is based on how your application recovers, but the storage will recover basically almost immediately. One way to um, make your application able to be what I call zone aware is a, it's a relatively new capability. I think it came out in Kubernetes 1.19 but it's been available since OpenShift 4.6. It's called topology spread constraints. And it does require that you have replicas. Um, if you only had you know, one instance of, of your application, it wouldn't really matter. But as long as you have two replicas, um, you can use uh, the topology Kubernetes uh, zone label to, to spread your, your replicas for your application among the zone. That can be a hard affinity. So that, you know, you, in some cases, you don't want your, your replicas to, to fail over to the active zone because the next time if you fail, you, you know, you could lose a zone and all your replicas would be on the same zone. So this is a really powerful concept. Um, in the demo, you'll see where I've applied it to, um, to Kafka. And we also, um, post, uh, Crunchy Postgres uses a very similar capability. The application that we're going to take a look at um, to sort of challenge ourselves here <laughs> is uh, called Smart City, Green City. And some of the colleagues in my group um, in uh, OpenShift Foundation um, uh, created this uh, demo. And it um, has a lot of pieces to it, so it, it makes it sort of challenging to, to recover. But what we have here is, um, if it was deployed, the demo doesn't have two different open shifts or multiple open shifts, um, but you have an edge environment, which is basically collecting whatever data you're trying to collect, whether that be image data or other data. Then you run it through a, a model, in this case, a license plate retrieval model. And then you're going to basically put it onto the uh, edge Kafka bus go through Kafka Mirror Maker, come down to the core Kafka bus, and then various um, applications are going to pull from that. Um, and then Kafka consumers are going to basically take the messages and then write them into the Crunchy Postgres uh, database. And since I don't really mention in the demo, I just want to say that um, I deployed this using the latest uh, Crunchy po uh, Data Postgres version, version 5.0. It has a new, um, I think it's a new uh, custom resource, Postgres cluster. And I found it um, extremely, I mean, I'm not making a pitch more than what Andrew did, but I did find it extremely easy to do, uh, to create a replica as well as um, make the, the replica place, placement um, have a zone anti-affinity. And, um, it was uh, a really pretty easy experience. So this is using the latest Postgres or Crunchy uh, Postgres version five. The other thing, if you've used Crunchy Postgres before, there's no longer, um, you don't have to install a specific PGO uh, client for, for doing the kinds of things that um, Andrew went over. You can use uh, kubectl or, or uh, OpenShift CLI commands to do, to do everything. 
So following this second stage, so we start with, uh, you know, getting the data at the edge, um, move it through the mirror maker, um, maybe do some, some special things with the data before you um, pass it on. And then there's, there's some object buckets involved where data is stored and pulled from. And then eventually uh, we're going to do some calculations and, um, you know, uh, similar to, I, I live in California. I don't know if, but anyway, all of the California toll locations as you go in and out of San Francisco area are now doing this. And um, they, they, they basically recognize your, or get your license plate and then I, I have an account and they charge me for going past, you no longer stop at any uh, toll, toll booths. So for this situation, we're going to um, challenge a few of our applications. Crunchy data is, um, like I said, it has a, a primary and a replica and each one of them, and we'll see in the demo how they're uh, made to stay in their particular zone. And we're going to fail one and see, um, see that it switches to primary. The other thing we're going to do is uh, Kafka. So Kafka is part of the solution. If Kafka, Kafka um, is not able to recover, then it wouldn't really matter because it sort of, you know, has the messages and it's providing all, all of the other apps with what they need. So the way that, that uh, you can make Kafka currently is you, you need to have Zookeeper, has to have Quorum. So again, using a toleration, I placed one of the Zookeeper pods onto the Arbiter or Consensus location on the master so that Zookeeper Quorum will be kept. So if we lose two of the Kafka replicas, two of the Zookeeper replicas, we've still got, um, and, and within the Kafka cluster config, you can set a, a custom kind of attribute that allows you to say that Kafka can continue to operate with two replicas. All right, so I think we're, it's demo time. The demo today is going to be for an application that uh, is called Smart City. And as you can see, it has a lot of different um, apps that, that make it up. Um, the main components that we're going to look at being resilient is the Kafka core uh, cluster, which is in the bottom square, the Postgres uh, database uh, using Crunchy, and the storage, which is not um, shown here, the storage from OpenShift Data Foundation. So on the top, we have what would be called edge locations. Those would actually be separate OpenShift clusters. But in the case of this demo, we're going to emulate that with a, what we call a safe node. So everything on the top will be on a single node that doesn't fail. And on the bottom, this is where we're going to be failing um, OpenShift nodes to see what happens. So if we go to uh, the OpenShift cluster and the, uh, the console, we can see that we have quite a few operators, um, starting with the Red Hat AMQ streams. That's going to give us uh, Kafka. And we, again, we have two Kafka clusters, Edge and Core. We also are going to use Grafana to uh, look at the data and be able to see um, that the application is running. Local storage is used by OpenShift Container Storage to create the storage cluster using Ceph. Open Data Hub uh, Operator is where we get the, we launch the Grafana as well as a Superset, which is going to be used for uh, a dashboard that data scientists would use. If we want to look at uh, further, the components, we can go ahead and start with the nodes. We have um, three masters and we have five worker nodes. As I said, the one on the bottom is the safe node, so it's not going to be failed. If we wanted to look at how they're divided, they're divided with a topology label. And this topology label is also what all of 
the components use to be able to be zone aware. And if we look at the, the arbiter, this would be, um, this node would be at a location, a third site, so that it could actually um, act as an arbiter and reach consensus for both etcd, we'll see zookeeper, as well as the, um, the storage, the, the monitors need consensus. So this is our consensus or arbiter node. If we then look at how the data nodes are divided, we have a label for them called data center one. Data center one has two worker nodes in it. Um, the Kafka core pods are here. Uh, the storage pods are here. And then the last one would be the data center two. And again, it's going to be the, uh, using the topology label, we define a second data center. So we basically have three zones, an arbiter for consensus, and then two uh, data centers that would reflect different sites that were within uh, 100 to 200 miles apart. We also can take a look at the pods. And for the pods, let's start with the edge Kafka. So here we have three that are going to be um, our edge cluster. And in this case, as I said, they're all on the same node. This is the safe node that is not going to be powered off. And this is you know, emulating a, another OpenShift cluster that would be um, collecting essentially the, the data, putting it onto the Kafka bus, and then getting it via Mirror Maker over to the core. If we now look at the core, so these are the core, um, each one of these is using a uh, OpenShift Data Foundation uh, volume for its storage. And if we were to look over here to the right, again, the nodes are all different. So these are the four nodes that represent data center one and data center two, and there's a Kafka pod spread on each one. The way that that, that, that is done to make sure that um, it's just not you know arbitrary how they're done, it is done with um, topology spread. So this was added to the Kafka cluster. This is something you can add. Um, and the operator will use that to, to schedule. So we can see that we're using the topology Kubernetes IO zone in the top. We're using it to um, make sure that, that there are pods on both zones. And then the second where it uses the Kubernetes IO host name, that is to spread if there's more than one pod per zone, then it will spread the pods among the hosts. So that's exactly what we saw. We saw four Kafka pods on four different hosts. So we know now that um, the Kafka is spread there. Let's go ahead and look at the storage. So for that, we're going to use label. And We'll start with the actual storage devices. So there's going to, again, similar to Kafka, there'll be one per uh, node. And this is, again, using that topology label. And the way that the storage works is it is um, configured to, for every volume to, every volume is created with four replicas but the minimum size that, are, that a volume can continue to um, support reads and writes is two. So we can lose two of, of the four here and the storage will still operate totally fine. The last thing I wanna look at here is Postgres. So we have two replicas here. This third one is for um, backup, but these two replicas are again using topology spread and we can see here they're on two different nodes. If we inspect the, how the, the placement is being done, we can look into the YAML here. Here's uh, how the topology spread is done. Um, first, we're, we're placing it on a node that's in either data center one or data center two. 
And then second, we're using the, um, the pod anti-affinity based on the topology label. So now let's see what happens when we have a failure. So we've got a couple of terminal windows here and I wanna explain what, what you're looking at. Um, top terminal window is just showing a view of the nodes. Right now um, we have three masters. The next two workers are in data center one by label and the next two are in data center two again. Um, and master zero, the very first one is the arbiter or consensus node and it would be placed at a third site um, it can be at a higher, um, what we'd say latency or distance. So it could be maybe, you know, 500 miles away, maybe more. And then the two, um, sites that have the, the data center one, data center two, they need to be, you know, not more than maybe a couple hundred miles apart. And then the last node is my safe node. Uh, right under that is a view of the two, um, crunchy Postgres pods and they are, uh, because of topology spread or, or pod anti-affinity, they are in each a different uh, data center or zone. And one currently is master, the one that is in uh, data center two, and the one in data center one is a replica. Down at the left is a view of the storage. Um, this is actually what we call Ceph status. Uh, it's looking very good right now. All of our uh, monitors are in quorum and all of our storage is up. On the right is uh, Kafka Cat, which is um, showing us the message on the topic called LPR, License Plate Retrieval. And we can see that right now um, we're, we're definitely continuing to um, get that. So what, what does that look like? from a dashboard point of view. This is what the Grafana dashboard is looking like. And this is obviously a demo and it's not really London right now. But um, if you notice uh, the, the car images will be changing, that would be, you know, cars going by these locations. Uh, an image is collected and then that goes to the model um, through the edge, handed over via the Kafka mirror and to the core and then um, stored in the database. And then this, um, this particular Grafana dashboard is pulling this data from the database. So what we want to do now is we want to create a failure and see how long it takes to recover. So to do that, um, I have over here vSphere and we're in, um, a cluster called perf1 and what we need to do is take down data center 2. Our primary uh, Postgres replica is on data center 2 so we want to go ahead and take that down to show you know sort of the worst case of what could happen. It'll also impact Kafka and it will definitely impact the storage as well. So I'm powering down two nodes not going to power down the master at that location just so that we continue to have access to CLI. So now on the bottom right, we can see that Kafka cat has stopped. Um, we're also starting to see some things happen in the storage here. The storage has gone into warn and we are seeing on the top um, that we have at least one node that's not ready. Soon we'll have two. It takes about 60 seconds. There we go. And we can see that down and again, the opposite um, right, the Kafka is starting to recover. Um, in the middle there with the, 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 the crunchy uh, Postgres replicas, now we have two masters. So it has already switched over and made the, the opposite um, zone now that is active, the master, and we can see that Kafka has totally recovered now. If we look over to the left, um, we can see that we do have, we still have quorum on our mons because of our consensus site. 
So we've lost half our storage. We basically have switched replicas on Postgres. Kafka has totally recovered now with two of four replicas. Now, if we go back here, um, it doesn't look like we're quite recovered. Oh, there we are. So we, we've now recovered and we are now um, continuing to receive images from the edge and this data is being pulled from the database. So by the time we got back here, it had already recovered. The recovery is somewhere in the range of uh, a couple minutes. It's, um, it's quite quick. So just to prove though that, that everything um, really is down, we can look at the, the pods and see what their status is now. So that'll be rook dash ceph dash OST. And we see that we have two of them in pending, which means they're, they're not able to schedule because they need to stay on the, the zone that's currently down there. Um, the the anti-affinity is a strict anti-affinity for zone. The monitors again are used um, to uh, keep track of the cluster and again we have two that are pending three that are running important one of them is on our consensus node or our arbiter zone at a third location so it is it is keeping the quorum for the uh, the storage cluster let's just go ahead now and look at postgres so We'll look at the, um, the label here. And we have one um, in a terminating, one running. The one in terminating is on the data center two, and the one running is on data center one. We saw uh, in the terminal that switchover was very, very quick um, within seconds. And then lastly, if we just look at Kafka, we see that we have uh, two running. And those two are on data center one, and the two on data center two are in a terminating state. Um, the two that are that are working are using um, OpenShift Data Foundation um, stuff, uh, what we call RBD volumes, and um, that is keeping the the core Kafka cluster going. The the two replicas. So in summary, to run our smart city application we have um, the the images are changing the counts are changing and we were able to recover thank you so i was just going to say these are some resources if you um, diane's going to make the slide set available and um, there is a readme for setting up uh, the smart city demo it's not currently um, configured to be highly available as I did, but uh, certainly if you're interested, reach out to me and I can give you the, the deltas for how to make it highly available. We also have uh, a, a guide, uh, a couple guides on how to configure OpenShift container storage um, for uh, using an arbiter and um, how to recover. So, and then uh, Andrew, did you want to talk about your resources? Uh, yeah, sure thing. So the the links there should basically bring bring you to the uh, the Postgres operator um, doc documentation. So you know the the bullet point second from the bottom there um, that should take it take you to our various documentation we have out there. And then that final link is a repository uh, where we have some examples. So we have uh, basically a suite of examples out there that demonstrate different use cases, um, you know, of how to get the PostgreSQL operator up and running um, across a wide variety of different use cases. So it's a great place to start for anyone that's looking yeah. to experiment with the operator. So, yeah, yep. that's, Thank that's you. actually the section I used as well. Again, if you don't see something, um, I, I know right away I didn't see how to make it uh, the replica zone aware, but if, you know, feel free to reach out to one of us if um, you don't see something in those examples. Okay, well, I think that's it, Diane. There's one question that just came in, um, okay. and, and, I, and it was probably the question I asked you guys beforehand, because I love the demo, uh, the mm -hmm. Smart City demo, because uh, you know everybody's been through a tell booth, everybody's had their, 
their license plate scan somewhere. It's always interesting to see how it, it all works in the background too. But um, Dan's sort of asking um, at whether or not Red Hat Consulting um, or maybe the Data Foundations Group have, has done any of this um, as a service, um, set it up as a service yet. Not yet, but um, good question. We we are looking to take uh, this sort of this this is one of the demos that we're working on, but we're we're looking at taking these forward, working with um, the OpenShift Data Hub group and and such. So yeah, again, um, reach out. But yeah, we're 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 going to make these more available. Uh, right now, it's just a README. But um, but looking to make them available in a in a, a more persistent way. All right. Well, I know a lot of work went into getting this um, up and running and um, making this demo work and making it HA. So uh, I really appreciate the time you guys took to do this and to walk us through this. And as always, Crunchy, um, thanks for all the work that you've done. Um, you've been one of the earliest users of the operator framework and getting Postgres operators and helping us debug the early days of the operator framework. So you have a place that's near and dear to my heart always. Um, so uh, we'll definitely have you back and we'll be doing more of this um, uh, data open source, OpenShift Data Foundations um, talks um, in the up and coming future. So look for that and we'll post this video up on YouTube with all of these wonderful links and resources for you to get started. So please do reach out to Annette and um, to the good folks over at Crunchy, and we will um, look forward to hearing um, about your use cases for this um, these applications. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great week. All right, thank you. Take thank care. Thank you. All. Thanks, Annette.